Good evening or good afternoon or maybe good morning, uh, depending on where you're joining from today. Um, please type in the chat where you are joining from, how many people are watching with you. And if you are able, please acknowledge the native land which you occupy. And if you do not know that information, I am putting into the chat um, a link where you can find that out. Um, so welcome already, Mary and Nate in Chicago from the Northwest side. Um, yes, we are also looking forward to great outdoor weather tomorrow. Lori in Oak Park, Illinois, the land of the Council of the Three Fires. Um, Liz in Westchester, also Council of the Three Fires. Jordan, the same, wonderful, thank you all. Please keep checking in. If you're just joining us, um, we are asking you all to have your chats fill this room. Ben so Oak we Park, know Illinois, the land of the Council of the Three Fires. Um, Liz, Fires, Jordan, the same. Wonderful. Thank you all. Please keep checking in. If you're just joining us, um, we are asking you all to have your chats fill this room. Ben so Oak Park, we know Illinois, the land of the Council of the Three Fires. Um, Liz. Fires, Jordan, the same, wonderful. Hey folks, it looks like Anna might be having some audio difficulties, but I just want to shout out as we keep seeing folks coming in, we have Maggie from Lombard, land of the Potawatomi here. Thanks for joining Maggie. We have Reggie from Chicago, Annette from Chicago. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. Really appreciate you joining today. Um, I'm gonna move us forward. Anna generally does these remarks. Uh, my name's Garen. I, I run some of the tech behind the scenes. And uh, as Anna mentioned, we're really grateful to you all for your participation here tonight. And I uh, just want to move us forward with the program. So uh, this is a welcome to this festival screening event. We hope it provides us all with rich opportunities for learning, a brave and safe space for important conversations, and a way to move from inspiration to action. A quick note that this film contains heavy themes and some disturbing images. We've listed it as appropriate for ages 17 plus at parents' discretion, though the film covers fast fashion and other topics of interest to older teens. Welcome to One Earth's Earth Week Mini Film Festival in continuing partnership with the city of Chicago. The One Earth team, together with Chicago's Chief Sustainability Officer, Angela Tovar, and her team, invite you to join us in turning the tide on our climate crisis. This week, we're joining forces in using the power film to create a sea change on topics of environment and those intersected with environment, like racial, social, and economic justice. Here is a brief word from Angela now. Hello, my name is Angela Tovar, and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of Chicago. It's an incredible honor to be here with you and to partner with One Earth to bring you another exciting Earth Day mini film festival. We commend the One Earth Collective for curating this incredible lineup of films and for all of the important programming that they lead year round to foster thought provoking dialogues on pressing environmental issues through a justice lens. This Earth Week, the city of Chicago will release its updated climate goals through the 2022 climate action plans to identify new and ambitious targets and to reaffirm our commitment to climate action and the delivery of equitable co-benefits that our communities need to thrive. We look forward to joining you all for an exciting week of film viewing and discourse and a continued partnership to move the city toward a more just and equitable climate future. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for your words and for your continuing collaboration. As we celebrate the 52nd anniversary of Earth Day this week, we continue our hybrid fest format presenting virtual and Chicago area in-person events. And we remain committed to our unique community-based model of raising awareness, engaging in dialogue, and being inspired to act on behalf of our one Earth. A powerful image and call to collective action in light of this year's festival theme, Turn the Tide, are the words of Japanese writer Ryanusuke Satoru. Individually, we are one drop. Together, we are an ocean. As always, our agenda will be to introduce you to folks who will join us in a rich discussion after the film, to watch the film together, to unpack the film's themes with our facilitator and panelists. Please participate using the chat. And finally, to share actions we can all take to be part of the solution. I'd now like to make a few brief acknowledgements. 
First, as we reframe narratives around justice, environment, and equitable solutions to our climate crisis, we acknowledge the many filmmakers and subjects, facilitators, and panelists joining us this week. Thank you. Second, One Earth Collective is based in Chicago, the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi Nations, and home to many other tribes, including today, peoples from over 100 tribal nations. And yet, there are no federally recognized tribes in Illinois, due in part to colonization, relocation, and genocide. One Earth commits to including films that center indigenous stories and voices. Beyond acknowledging the native lands we each occupy, we must lift up and support the work of First Nations groups. If you're in the Chicago area, please support the important work of the American Indian Center Chicago, Indigenous Environmental Network, Shy Nations Youth Council, and others, and watch for Native Truths, Our Voices, Our Stories, an exhibition co-curated by the Field Museum and collaborators from more than 100 tribes, opening next month. A third acknowledgement. Shared agreements can help our conversation remain safe and respectful. When participating today, please put aside your preconceptions, acknowledge your privilege, internalize what you've learned, Approach the conversation with respect, engage your active listening, and use I statements and get comfortable with your own story. A quick note before we meet our facilitator and program participants, please amplify today's voices on social media. The hashtags for the festival are hashtag OEFF2022 and hashtag Turn the Tide. And now I'd like to turn it over to our facilitator to introduce themselves, the panelists, and our film. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Seva Gandhi with Collaborative Connections. Um, I am a longtime supporter of the One Earth Film Fest. Um, and I spend my time here in Chicago in the Edgewater neighborhood. Um, and I do facilitation and I do training around environmental work, anti-racism work, and community development. One of the things that I really love about the Film Fest is that uh, oftentimes we go and we watch films and then we ask people, what did you think? And we don't really get a time to explore um, all of the things that just passed before our eyes. And this Film Fest gives us a little bit of an opportunity to do that with interesting in ways of engaging with one another and the film after after we watch it. And today we have a special guest with us, uh, Tobita Chow. I don't know if we get to see Toby real quick. There he is. Um, and he's uh, from the Justice is Global the Pe and the People's Action Institute. We're going to learn uh, more about Toby after the film. Um, but we uh, saw the film and then saw sort of what Toby does uh, for work. I was like, wow, this is a more perfect person couldn't ex exist to digest this film. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we will be watching Ascension. And afterwards, we'll have two ways of engaging with us to, and, and talking with Toby and learning more about Toby's work and how it links to this film. And so you came to this film because you were told that it was nominated for the 2022 Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Um, and it's an impressionistic exploration of the pursuit of wealth and the paradox of progress in the People's Republic of China. Ascension examines what is living the so-called Chinese dream and what that looks like today. Um, in the film, we'll find contemporary vision of China that prioritizes productivity and innovation um, and a lot of other very nuanced pieces that we can explore a little bit later with Toby. So um, as Garen said earlier, uh, this film does contain some um, heavy themes and disturbing images. So we do recommend it for 17 plus um, or parents discretion. And I think that that is about it. Is that correct, Garen and Anna? I think we're gonna start the film. All right. Thanks, everyone. We encourage you to uh, stay with us and chat a bit about the film. Um, as I said earlier, we have uh, Tobita Chow with us to help us digest that film. But uh, I would love everyone to just take a deep breath in. There was a lot that happened uh, on that film. And so just give yourself a moment to take that breath in and just sort of relax a little. We're going to take some time to digest it together. Um, so many so many beautiful images, so many jarring images, and we'll, we'll chat about that. Um, what I would like you to do actually, um, and I think we're gonna show this on the screen or maybe in the chat, we're gonna try out a, a little participation tool called Mentimeter. Um, so if folks are able to, um, Karen, are you, there you go. You can scan that, you can click on the link, I believe. Uh, Elaine's is a disturbing film. We, we will chat about that and what that means. Um, and I think somebody's going to put the link in the chat as well. But if you go to minty.com, 
Um, and there are uh, about eight numbers you should be able to type in, and I can tell you those. Garen, are you able to put the link in the chat for folks, or do they see the button somewhere? Maybe, maybe. Maybe Anna or Garen are not there. Okay, there should be a button above your screen and um, that allows you to go to the mentee. And if not, just go to menti.com, W or sorry, M E N T I.com and use the code 7498 and then 2933. Uh, we could also type that in the chat. And we're just going to use that to see if we can get some participation that way. There you go. I'm going to put that link in the chat too. There you go. And um, you can copy uh, the link Travis put in and put it in there. Anyway, let's get started. So if you can make your way there, there is a screen uh, to put in a word or a phrase or an image that stood out for you. Um, and I'd love it if folks are able to put that in. Let's see. Do folks see that? Are people able to type in a word or a phrase or an image in this page on Mentimeter? And Karen, are we able to see that live mentee? All right, Aria's has put her name in too. If other folks are there and you could do that, um, we'll, we'll just let the, that pop in as we start to talk to Toby. So Toby, I would love it. Um, I we watched this film and then I learned a little bit more about Toby work, uh, Toby's work, um, and I thought, wow, a more perfect person couldn't exist to discuss this film with. Uh, Toby is the director of Justice is Global, a special project of the People's Action to create a more just and sustainable global economy and defeat right wing nationalism. I'm going to let Toby share a little bit more about himself. So Toby, can you just share a bit more about your work and what you do? Yeah, uh, so uh, calling here from Chicago. Uh, I am the director of a project called Justice is Global. Uh, we work on issues of global justice and building international solidarity. Um, some of the issues that are uh, the focus of our work uh, include the US-China relationship. Uh, we've done a lot of work on um, uh, developing a progressive alternative to the current path of increasing tensions between the US and China, which we consider to be quite dangerous. Um, we also have a campaign uh, to uh, win global access to COVID vaccines to end the pandemic and to push the U.S. government and also pharmaceutical companies to share the vaccine technology that they've developed uh, to fight COVID uh, with the world, particularly developing countries in Africa and elsewhere. Um, and uh, we also have started to work on issues of uh, global climate justice, uh, international climate policy, and in particular, promoting international cooperation to uh, overcome the climate crisis. Um, and uh, prior to founding Justice is Global, which happened back in 2019, uh, I spent a number of years uh, working on building US-China worker solidarity uh, and uh, participated or helped organize a tour of um, some uh, worker activists from China who had been organizing in factories in China and came to the US to talk to uh, working class people in the United States. Um, so uh, that is work that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, however, in recent years, that kind of work has become uh, increasingly impossible as uh, crackdowns on labor activists in China have escalated to the point where it's actually quite dangerous for them to do that kind of collaboration with uh, activists in the US. Thank you so much, Shoei. And as you all can probably imagine, after watching this film, this will be a great person to learn a bit more about um, sort of their perspectives on what's going on. And thanks for sharing those words or phrases that stood out. I saw mind boggling there. I saw doom. Uh, there was a lot. And when I talked to Toby, he's like, oh, I love this film. <laughs> so everyone's got a slightly different perspective, confused, crowded progress that, that everything was raised, that quote at the end, um, that was a, a notable quote. Um, I would just, I would love to to hear, Toby, for you, what, what do you think the central message of the film was? What is it that we were sort of trying to communicate in that film? And folks, if you sort of move along on the mentee, you should be able to also answer that question and we can get that from you. But what did you see as the central message of this film? I think one of the central messages that the film was intended to convey is communicated by the poem that comes at the beginning and the end of the film, which is, um, 
by, I think it was the great grandfather of the filmmaker. Uh, when she was doing the this um, documentary in China, she tracked down her ancestry and found out that she had um, an ancestor who was a, a prominent poet. Um, and there is a, a poem uh, that expressed what she saw as a theme of, of this documentary, which is um, both uh, China's economic rise and how that's impacting working class people in China, uh, but also this dynamic where um, something that comes with China's rise is um, uh, increasing uh, an increasing sense of like chaos um, and threat and just new problems that come along with that. Um, and there's, um, I think, you know, a lot of different people in China would, would, would point to different problems that have come with China's economic rise. Um, and one that is um, important in my work is that this has brought China um, more and more into uh, sort of geopolitical tensions uh, with the United States, which has had profound and overall, I think, negative impacts on, on politics, uh, both in the U.S. and in China. Um, uh, the other major theme, though, that I think in, in, is very important in this film is um, just to portray uh, a, a wide range of ordinary working class people in China. I think very most often uh, in, in discourse or like media portrayals about China that you get here in the U.S., um, China is presented as sort of this faceless mass. Um, this like monolithic thing. And you don't really get a, a view of, of sort of individual Chinese people. Uh, this is true of a lot of uh, the rest of the world uh, as well. Um, but this is definitely a problem in when it comes to coverage of China and discourse around China. And um, something that I hope comes through in, in this documentary is a sense that of, of just like ordinary um, uh, working class people in China as individuals, you know, they have hopes and dreams. Uh, they feel all kinds of different ways about the jobs uh, that they do. Sometimes, you know, they appreciate the work that they have. Sometimes they find it really frustrating and they aspire for better and uh, they uh, make the best of the op opportunities that are made available to them. Um, and uh, I hope that there are pieces of that that are familiar to uh, the lives that we live here in the United States um, and that we can come to see that uh, uh, for all the differences between people in different countries, um, underlying those, uh, we face a lot of the same kinds of problems that need similar solutions. Thank you for that, Toby. Yeah, and I, I think somebody put this in the in the chat, we're ascending up the economic ladder. And I think that that um, is, a, is a really great way to talk about the film as well, because we, we get to go through and see all of the different classes and all of the different things that are going on, and how that it, even within themselves, they're just one, you know, it's a it's one ecosystem, but then when you think about it globally and how we're all part of that same ecosystem, you can see the same stuff happening there, happening here, but we're just, you know, we're, we're pretty good at hiding stuff here in the States. <laughs> um, but I think that, that that was really helpful. Thank you, Toby. Um, so I don't know if you're able to see any of the stuff, the key messages that folks are typing in the Minty, but they're interesting. Um, and uh, you can lift any of those up, but I would love it if you could just share some nuances um, we had so many different uh, images and so many different classes that we went through and how they all sort of interconnected, but some nuances that you picked up in the film that you think maybe folks who aren't in this work day in and day out might have missed. Yeah, I think um, one of the themes that's picked out in one of the comments is that this is about um, um, the rise of China as a capitalist country um, and the impact that that has on workers in China. Um, uh, and um, uh, I think, you know, um, there are what to me are like just some important basic facts about the Chinese economy. You sort of see glimpses of, um, um, but like bringing them out into the open can maybe help contextualize some of the pieces of the documentary. Um, so China has undergone uh, a tremendous economic rise um, in the past few decades. Uh, a lot of people in China are uh, enjoying uh, increased prosperity as a result of that. Um, there is, however, uh, at the same time, uh, increasing inequality and very high levels of inequality um, within China. So even though there is overall increasing prosperity and uh, the majority of people in China are benefiting from that, uh, there's at the same time very high inequality. And you can see some of that. You can see people working in factory jobs that you can tell uh, are not paying very well 
And then you also get glimpses of um, some uh, wealthier and more prosperous uh, people um, in China. And then you also see like other workers in China who are trying to get jobs as like servants <laughs> for these like wealthy elite uh, people in China. Um, so there's this whole spectrum. Um, this is all in urban areas in, in rural parts of China. Uh, there's even more extreme poverty, um, which is you know a phenomenon we also see in the US. Um, and um, uh, in, in the midst of all of that, uh, you get extreme competition uh, for, for getting good jobs. Um, there's a one scene where there's like the, this uh, party at a water park um, and it's for um, students, high school students who have just um, written their uh, exams that are gonna uh, determine whether they get into college or what, what, how good of a college they get into. Um, extreme levels of competition there. They're all having this great party because they've been under tremendous stress preparing for these uh, college entrance exams. Um, enormous amounts of competition. Uh, and <clears throat> a lot of these students, when they graduate from college, a big problem in China right now is that new college graduates, uh, they get out of school and there's not enough good jobs for them, uh, which again, very similar problem that uh, young people face in the United States. You go to college and can you get a job that um, actually suits the education that you got very often not. So they end up competing for like gig work and, and jobs that are not well paid and aren't sort of what they were promised as part of the deal of um, going, going to a good school and, um, and pursuing in sort of the, the Chinese dream, which is the counterpart there to our American dream here. Um, and uh, a lot of, with, the, with China's economic rise, there are lots of new opportunities, but there are also, um, there's also been a lot of loss. Uh, there's been severe deindustrialization, a lot of factory closures uh, within, within China, which is pushing a lot of workers, including college graduates into like low paid gig work. Uh, and then you see there like people in the documentary, people chasing careers as like social media influencers and, and things like that. Um, so um, uh, within the context of, of rising uh, prosperity and, and the rising economy in China, a lot of uh, social problems that still persist in the face of that. Um, and something that the documentary doesn't cover um, and, and isn't meant to, and that's cool, but is also an important fact is um, that this has led to a lot of unrest and protest um, among um, Chinese workers. And I think that's a really important fact about, about China that, um, uh, that we shouldn't overlook. Thanks. Thanks for that, Toby. In just a moment, we're going to ask uh, other folks to ask uh, you questions, but I have a few more left. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting, uh, a friend of mine is always like, you know, we always talk about capitalism being about money, but really, truly what it's about is about time. And it's about how you're able to use your time and what your time is it yours uh, to even have. And I think this movie does a really excellent job talking up, sort of displaying that in a re really unique way that this is about time, what you're able to do, what you're not able to do, and what your life becomes about, um, regardless of the dollars attached to that time. Um, what I would love, uh, I, I asked you this question, I think when we talked previously is like one earth film fest is, you know, traditionally about just environmental films. And here we are showing like a very class based, like a, it's about labor, it's about capitalism, it's about class. I would love to, uh, your take. Um, there are some images in some ways the environment is sort of brought in, but how do you see sort of the intersection of all of that with the environment as brought out by this film? Yeah, so like I said, um, one of the ideas that I hope you can get a sense of from this film is uh, that um, a lot of uh, that there are a lot of problems that um, average people in China face um, that I think can be very relatable um, to people in the United States, like the hope for a better life, um, uh, lack of opportunities, um, dissatisfaction with the job opportunities that are open to you and sort of the competition that comes out of that. Um, and that sense of like shared problems um, and that, that then opens up to the potential that like, oh, maybe there's some shared solutions that we can actually pursue together, um, I think is a really important perspective to bring into issues of the climate crisis and um, in other forms of environmental harm um, I think people have commented on the, the sort of the, the harm to the environment that you get glimpses of um, in this film. Um, that is something that concerns uh, a lot of people in China as well. Um, I talked earlier about how there have been worker protests in China um, in reaction to how workers get treated. There have also been a lot of um, quite powerful protests uh, in response to environmental damage from 
um, new forms of development and industrialization uh, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, the this, this sense of, um, uh, I, I think it's important to understand that we have these shared problems and that there are a lot of people in China who just like us hope for better. Um, and when it comes to these environmental issues and particularly around the climate crisis, um, the, the thing that I really emphasize uh, in my own work is the need for international cooperation, particularly between um, the US and, and China. Uh, there is a lot of good that th these two countries, the two top economies in the world, there's a lot of good that we could do together to uh, come up with shared solutions to the climate crisis, which, which can only be solved um, through global cooperation um, between all countries, uh, but particularly between the US and China. And um, I think uh, understanding um, just the range um, and complexity of society in China and um, the different problems that people face there and also the different hopes and aspirations that exist among the Chinese people um, can help um, uh, make, it, make it clear that there are real opportunities for us to, to, to um, cross the, the, the the differences that are used to divide us and work towards uh, shared solutions. Thanks for that, Toby. And um, you'll notice on the Menti, you can type in some uh, some questions for Toby that uh, you yourself have. Please do that, or you can type them in the chat if you're still on the chat. Um, oh, I think we were talking about earlier, Toby, the 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 whole recycling bit. Everyone is, knows that there's a problem here. Um, where they're like, well, something's happening with recycling. Even here in Chicago, it's been something that we've been talking about for ever, not being able to get right. But the fact that you know China stopped taking our garbage or our recycling about four or five years ago, or and we've never been able to find a, a replacement, and so we don't know how to make it cost effective to do recycling. So recycling does not happen anymore. But it's people don't understand that, and you'll see images of places with all of this trash um, that are in other nations, and it's usually just U.S. trash that's like put back out into the universe. But people think it's produced elsewhere. Uh, it's a problem for elsewhere, but it's it's our stuff, um, and there's just no accountability there. I don't see any questions coming in from the audience yet. Do you have anything to say in response to that while we get some questions in? Yeah, I think um, it's uh, uh, that, that issue around recycling, like this is a systemic problem. Um, it's also a problem that we need to take responsibility for. Like the recycling issue, um, what that's really about is that we have um, uh, been dumping uh, this problem of like how to uh, deal with uh, recyclable um, trash. Um, and we've sort of been dumping that problem in other countries, um, particularly on China, but, but other lower income countries. Um, and uh, that was never a sustainable solution uh, to this problem. Uh, we pursued it because it's the cheap solution. It's not the sustainable solution or the real solution. Um, so this is uh, like so many other environmental problems or social problems in, in general, just a question of like, are we willing to invest what is necessary to actually solve the problem or are we just going to dump it on uh, other people, uh, people on the other side of the world, less privileged people um, and so on. Thanks, thanks Toby. We had one question um, in is, how does a one child policy impact the climate crisis in China, uh, both directly or indirectly in your opinion? That's an interesting question. Um, so uh, um, the one child policy was introduced uh, in China uh, to um, prevent what they saw as uh, a problem of like uh, too rapid population growth. Um, and um, there were a lot of, of reasons why they were worried about that. I don't actually know for sure how highly environmental concerns ranked among um, the, their motivations for implementing um, that policy, uh, but you know that clearly has had um, an environmental impact um, in terms of you know you keep the you keep the population under control and that. Um, then uh, that has impacts on resource use and, and so on. Um, 
So you, you could see that as, 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 as a positive. I, I worry about that though. I think like you, we get into risky territory when we start to see um, population control in lower income countries is the solution to environmental problems. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I think that gets you, gets us into like very dangerous political territory. And uh, I would rather think about, um, you know, we, I think we do have the resources um, to give everyone on the planet what they need to survive and thrive, and also the technology and know-how and and the, the and 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 the resources to create a global economy um, that can uh, uh, stabilize uh, the climate um, and uh, and and reduce uh, other forms of environmental damage. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there's more to say about now. There's been um, the end of the one ch uh, one child policy, and now uh, the Chinese government is more concerned about um, what looks to be uh, a drop in in population growth, which they see is creating other problems. Um, um, and uh, uh, there's all kinds of concerns that we could raise here. Um, there's like feminist critiques of how they're pursuing um, the shift in, in in policy towards families in China. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. No, and I think uh, one of the things, there's so few lines of dialogue in the film, but one of those lines that we do get is when folks are sitting around and, you know, folks who have money in this very fancy dinner and they're talking about how, well, we should actually, you know, we have the, we should get to five times the consumption of the U.S., uh, which is just totally wild. And it's not generally the folks who are, um, again, this movie has a really a strong class analysis. It's not folks who don't have the money that are usually creating the problems. Um, it's a, a particular uh, group of folks. We have one, another question that came in, which I think you will actually enjoy, which is how much of an opportunity um, do the lower um, and middle class of China actually have to speak out? Um, and our voices here are not heard in the U.S. and we're told China is worse. Um, can folks really do anything, in your opinion? Um, there is um, maybe more space for people to raise uh, a lot, a lot of different kinds of grievances than um, I think uh, you might you might think just based on a lot of the portrayals of of China. Um, anything that uh, would appear to threaten the rule of the Chinese Communist Party, um, that uh, though, once you get into that territory, severe crackdowns. Um, so uh, unfortunately, a lot of labor activism has now sort of entered that category in the, in the view of the Chinese government. Um, so it is very difficult to engage in any kind of sustained labor activism at this point. Um, but if you have like a small scale local labor protest, um, around like one workplace that is not very well politically corrected, um, you can oftentimes get away with it and uh, get your grievances addressed. Um, if you have uh, concerns about uh, a polluting factory in your community um, and, uh, and, you know, your community comes together, uh, you can sometimes get away with a protest uh, and, and sometimes get your grievances addressed. Um, uh, there is a lot of censorship on social media, um, but it's not as good or as thorough as it's sometimes portrayed in, in the U.S., I think. Um, so um, if it's not, if, it, if you don't get into some of the topics that are considered the most threatening um, to the government, um, there is some space uh, to raise your concerns and that, that you can even sometimes uh, end up um, uh, getting some of your grievances um, addressed. It's a uh, it's really interesting um, that at the same time, there are severe restrictions on freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Um, but at the same time, the Chinese government is like very concerned about popular opinion um, and, and, like, and like doing something to address grievances that seem to be widespread uh, because above all, they want to prevent wide scale uh, social unrest. So if they can start to get a sense that a lot of people are concerned about something, working conditions, um, environment, the environment or anything else, then they will sometimes take steps to address that just to sort of maintain social peace. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, like there's, it's sort of contradictory. Um, but, um, so all these things are true at the same time. Thanks for that, Toby. 
Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. I don't know how we are in time, but um, there's a question is, what is the interplay between um, workers' rights and environmental policy uh, in China? Is the government at all incentivized to pursue one over the other? And I think you kind of talked about this, but I don't know if you have an answer. Yeah, um, let's see. Is the government incentivized to pursue one over the other? It's like, um, um, uh, Overall, I would say that the government, the Chinese government is considerably more hostile to worker activism than to environmental activism. Um, part of that is uh, they see worker activism as more of a threat. Um, and there's a history here. Uh, uh, many people will be familiar with the Tiananmen uh, protests in 1989. Um, something that's not often an uh, important part of the story that's not often told uh, in the U.S. is the role of, of labor unions and like sort of uh, independent worker unions uh, played a, a great role in those protests. Um, so the government is very paranoid about um, about the risks that could arise from sort of a, a national level labor movement um, coming joining forces with student activists, which is what happened in 1989. Um, so there's a lot of fears there, and, and labor activism has become um, uh, uh, one of the top um, sources of, of the crackdowns of the Chinese government. Um, and there's more, there's somewhat more space for um, environmentalist work. Um, and I, th I, I, I would imagine, I don't, I don't know this for sure, but I would imagine part of that would have to do with the fact that very often environmental concerns can get raised by people who are more well off and um, um, like more middle class people or even uh, more prosperous people um, that uh, uh, and it, it would create somewhat more problems for the government to crack down on more privileged people rather than, um, you know, low wage workers in a factory. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, in that respect, I, I think there's more space for environmentalism in, in China right now, um, which isn't to say that they never face crackdowns. They, they do. Um, the, the Chinese government is not <laughs> is not friendly to anyone uh, trying to engage in any kind of civil society activity in China. Um, but there are there are differences. Thanks for that, Toby. And we have one final question, and I think it's come up a lot in the chat. And I know Anna had talked about it. Um, and then we'll just sort of move to action. Um, but do you have any thoughts about the director's intent, or uh, sort of your assumption of intent, in the decidedly long scene with the in the sort of sex doll factory? Um, and is it addressing our topic of intimacy with our stuff, or what do you think sort of the intent was there? Somebody said, well, those folks are breathing in all that plastic. They're going to have really bad health outcomes. It's a, it's a, it's a provocative scene. Um, do you have a particular take on it? It is very striking to me. I think the point about intimacy is an interesting one. I think um, something that I think uh, in general about the global supply chains that supply us with basically everything that we use and consume is um, something that we forget is that, uh, you know, everything like, you know, the shirt and and these headphones, whatever, um, they, they show up at the store uh, already made. And we sort of, we lose sight of the fact that there are human beings um, uh, all around the world who like physically put this stuff together, like this this shirt that I'm wearing. And it's, it's like, um, there's something there about thinking about sort of the intimacy that we have with the things that we use. And we just sort of forget the human labor that went into them. And um, in some way, like the, the scene with the sex dolls sort of drama dramatizes that in a weird way. Like these, these, these commodities are, are just sort of where the intimacy, it's just very clearly intimate objects. Um, and um, um, yeah, I don't know. It's like also something that, that when I saw that scene, something that struck me was, um, uh, there are parts of it where it seems like these workers are, yeah, they're engaging in very dangerous activity. They're breathing in the fumes. They're talking about like these very hot instruments that they're using. And um, in some of those scenes, I'm like, please be careful. You are at a great risk of giving yourself severe burns. And they're doing this so that some much wealthier person can have a sex doll and um, that's messed up, right? Um, so I don't know what the filmmaker intended with that, but for me, that was a very striking scene. And those are some of the thoughts that occurred to me watching it. Yeah, and somebody's noting in the chat that sort of who were those dolls being made for and 
and what does that mean and who is it that we cater to? Um, so I want to, I want to thank you so much, uh, Toby, for bringing in, uh, you know, your expertise and background that sort of fits in so well to this film. Um, and I know you said you loved the film and that was great. Um, and I think it's surely provocative and something to think about for quite a while. Um, one of the things that we usually try to leave with, with at the film fest is sort of, well, what is this asking us to do? What is the film usually asking us to do differently? Um, or what is an action that we can take? Um, and so I would just invite folks, you can type it in the chat. Um, you can put it sort of, you can put it in the mentee and I can invite Toby in as well. Or just, what are some actions? Obviously this is about uh, consumption. So thinking about our consumption, thinking about sort of labor politics, who are you purchasing from? Where are your dollars going? Are you, you know, is it in Chicago, we've got our El Milagro strike. I know we don't have our tortilla chips, but what's going on there? Um, and learning a bit more about that. And um, we have Amazon to look to. We have a bunch of other places um, sort of for labor rights, but uh, consumption is a big theme here. Are there any other um, points of action that you would pull out, Toby, or other folks um, would say they're, they're called to action as a result of this one? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, regarding uh, issues around uh, uh, climate, uh, so this is, you know, in my own work in Justice is Global, uh, this is uh, something that we are new to, um, but uh, we are going to be uh, uh, launching a campaign this year around global climate justice, uh, looking particularly at um, how the U.S. can do better to meet the climate needs of developing countries um, and, uh, and also the need for international cooperation. Um, so, uh, there are no immediate action steps that, um, I, I, I can share, but, uh, those who are interested in following our work, uh, can go to our website and join our mailing list, uh, justiceisglobal.org. Uh, um, overall though, I think, um, uh, my, the recommendation that I will always make is, uh, uh, to join an organization. If it's not my organization, that's fine. Um, jo join an organization that is working on the issues, um, that you care about. Uh, the most important first step for all of us is to become uh, part of larger groups and larger collectives and stop seeing ourselves as individuals. I think that's the most important, important step to solve any of the problems that we face in our society right now. Thank you for that, Toby. Uh, yeah, and folks are uh, welcome to put in the chat that the theme of this year's uh, fest is turning the tide. So what are ways that we can turn the tide um, or that we can support groups that are doing the work and sort of move beyond that individual, but also um, into that collective uh, tide? Um, I don't know, Anna, if there's anything else that uh, or anyone else that we would need to say to folks. I want to thank everybody for trying out Mency with us. I want to thank Toby um, for his time. Um, and um Somebody has a, a great point of action in the chat, so that's great. Please put, put those in. Um, well, you can learn more about our panelists. There'll be sort of information about them or about Toby uh, in the chat. Um, you were able to tweet, post, or share about this experience. Um, please, there will be a survey that you get sent. Do fill, to, do fill that out. Um, and then join us again through Sunday. There's uh, more of more films um, in the City of Chicago Earth Week mini film fest that's going out now. Um, and just thank you all for joining with us in this film. This rainy, if you're in Chicago, if you're not, um, whatever weather you're having. Uh, is, it, is it Friday? No, maybe. Maybe it's a Friday evening. Um, thank you all so much uh, for coming. And it's been great being with you. <laughs>